I bought a uh, PRS um, Blister Tone 50, and I did a, a review on it when I first purchased it, and uh, went through everything that I liked about it and what information I could I could get on it. Um, after I, you know, uh, uh, after I purchased it, I went down to another boutique camp, um, more like I guess a boutique camp store called Bad Axe, and I auditioned some of their amps, and um, it got down to this one amp that I really, really liked. It was a, uh, I forget the exact model, but it was a top hat. And um, the thing that I liked about it the most was it sounded very similar to my blister tone, except for the biggest difference was it had, had this real smooth quality uh, to the overdrive. Whereas in the blister tone, tonally, almost sounded just like it with a slight bit of edginess to the distortion. So uh, and I decided I really liked the top hat actually a little bit better. Um, so I kind of looked into at that point what was making the top hat uh, more smooth or more round in its delivery um, than the blister tone. Um, the first thing I looked into was um, my blister tone 50 uh, the speaker, the matching speaker cabinet, uh, come with Celestion Vintage 30s. So of course I said, well, the first thing to do is to take my amp down to the store and head to head it against their amp going through their speaker cabinet. And when I did that, I got closer to that top hat type of sound, but I wasn't all the way there. I could still hear that little bit of edginess, that little bit of graininess over top of everything that wasn't there in the top hat. So I knew that the speakers were a portion of it, but it wasn't the sum of the it wasn't the, the, the sum of what I was hearing. So I went to another of, of my friends has a um, amp uh, amp repair shop and uh, named uh, his name is Phil Petit at uh, Tone Technologies. So I went over to him, told him exactly what I just told you guys about the whole sound of the the amp and the distortion, and this, that, and the other. And he was like, oh, well, he named off about three or four things that we could try. So I was like, okay, well, you know, it can't hurt to try. Um, so I took it in, and uh, he was able to mod it and pull out that frequency that, that I, I wasn't caring that much for. And uh, I really can tell you that now the only difference really between this one and the top hat right now is the speakers that I'm running because the top hat is running uh, uh, G12s. Uh, uh, G12, I think it's a G1275. Um, or it might be the Heritage. But I think it's the G12, G12 T75, I think is what came in it. Either way, the G12 T75 and the Heritage are completely different speakers tonally than a Celestian Vintage 30. I mean, they're all Celestians, but a Celestian Vintage 30 is a much more aggressive and has a much more, a bigger punch in the mid-range, whereas those uh, speakers are, are scooped in the mid-range and are a little softer on the high end. So I think the biggest difference now, the only thing I, I would do now is I would change the speakers in my cabinet. But for the time being, that's got me very close. And I'll explain to you what we did or what was explained to me <laughs> that we did. Not like I'm an amp guru. Uh, we, we put a capacitor in line on the input uh, that would take out some of the high frequencies. Then what we did is this amp has a 12 AX7 and V1, a 12 AX7 in V2, and V3 is a 12 AT7, because that's the phase inverter, 12 AT7. So what we did is we took the 12 AT7 out of the phase inverter and we put in a 12 AX7. And the reason we did that is because we were going to change V1 from a 12 AX7 to a 12 AU7. A 12 AU7 has a lot less 
gain and or output um, that are 12AX7. So that taking that out of the input stage of uh, gain stage one would drop the gain. Now the problem with that is, is dropping the gain that low could drop the volume of the amp. But since the phase inverter on this amp was a 12, um, a 12AT7, we replaced it with a 12AX7 to increase gain or increase power at the phase inverter section of the amp. So therefore, uh, there's, there's no volume loss. The amp is, even though it's cleaner, it's still just as loud as it was before we did anything to it. And that pretty much is all we did to the amp. But the sound of the amp is a lot, uh, a lot smoother now. Um, you know, before, if you put the amp on about two to three, you would start hitting your, you would start hitting your ACDC, uh, gain level. Now, you know, the volume is all the way to halfway up and that's where you get the So you're just now starting to get that break up now with the volume set at 12 o'clock. But you'll notice though, uh, the first thing you'll notice is that the distortion no longer has a spiky uh, quality to it at all. It's very smooth. Oops, turn the volume back up. But it's still very responsive. I go up to uh, position four and I'm still. Um, and that was the really the biggest thing we were going for. We didn't, I didn't want to take away from the, you know, the dynamic nature of the amp. I still want to be able to go from to just by just by changing pickups and pick attack, and uh, it's what I have. Um, the pedal. Well, uh, another thing that I also do is in order to add a little clarity, because I know some of you will say, "Well, it kind of sounds a little, a little muffled." Because, you know, I, as I explained to Philip when we got into this, I like a very dark sounding amp. I'm not one of these bright amp guys. I've never been able to stand the sound of just a really bright, high endy, high mids, upper mids uh, amp. I like, I like lower mids and I like bass. And I mean, I like it to be clear and audible, but not bright. You know, the, 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 most useless control on an amp for me is the presence knob because I hardly ever use it. Uh, it takes a special kind of amp to make me actually use uh, the presence. You know, the only time I ever even feel enticed to use presence is on a clean channel. But in order to get some of that back, I will sometimes engage the EP booster now. Which adds a little top-end clarity to it, but it doesn't have that same spiky quality uh, that the high-end had naturally in the amp before we modded uh, the tone circuit. So, now without the EP boosters. you take that same clean channel now take that hit that with something like a BB preamp and you get which is still very much distorted but it's uh, got that mid-range honkiness without being uh, ag ag aggressive in nature, you know, without having that aggressive fizzy thing that like 5150s do. But you know, now that you take something like uh, 
let's say the MXR5150 pedal. You turn that on, make sure the other one's off, and you still get the... And once again, you've got the gain. Still got the note separation. You can hear all the notes of the chord. And it's also not uh, spike. It doesn't have any of that sizzle. That's another word they use for it. it doesn't have any of that real 5150 sizzle, which for me is a good thing because I don't like that. Still, uh, I mean, it's really all you can say about it. I mean, there's not really, to me, there's not a, a pedal that sounds bad through. Well, like I said, even with the way that it's really good at taking pedal, I mean, it was good at taking pedal before the, uh, uh, before we modded the amps. So that much hasn't changed. channel still sounds to me really good you know just oops I guess my favorite uh, way to run the amp at the present is uh, I like to run the BB preamp fed by that and then boost um, the lows at about the 125 uh, 125 kilohertz and a 62 and then cut a little bit at 500 <laughs>
Smith uh, blister tone and uh, the uh, and the pedal board. But anyway, I'm Bill H2O. This is Big Gear Review, and thanks for watching.